Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this Passion for Knowledge uh, session. We're going to start uh, this morning's session, but before that, uh, let us make the most of these minutes we've got to take a picture. So um, that's what uh, we're going to be doing, and then we'll get started. Venga, venga. Venga, ahora, ahora, minuto, segundo va a tocar ya go. Raise your hands, please. Ay, que yo. Bye. Vale, os ando. So good morning, everyone, and welcome. My name is Itziar Otegi. I am uh, head of communication at Nanogune, and I'm here to chair this session. But of course, um, our guests are uh, the main characters of this film, and so are you members of the audience. I would like to give you a few instructions. Uh, there is simultaneous interpreting available, so uh, let me remind you that channel 1 is for Spanish, channel 2 would be for Basque, and uh, channel 3 for English. We are going to be sharing some photos on the social media with the hashtag uh, passion uh, DIPC. If you go there, you can look at the pictures that we'll be sharing and share your own uh, pictures yourselves. Let me first of all thank the uh, authorities uh, and uh, all the students that are here, all the teachers that are participating in this session, and uh, everyone that wanted to uh, join in. I would also like to, uh, of course, thank our dear guests. This is our 11th meeting with students, and we're really happy because it's going to be very special. Why? Because it's full of passion. We've been um, uh, plunging into our passion for knowledge for a week now, and uh, we're very happy to have you here. Uh, in uh, the evening, we're going to be having a new uh, session with uh, plenary lectures. Uh, and we are also going to have uh, the inclusive uh, experience drum. There will also be the Naukas session, uh, Pasión Chiqui, and also streamers sessions. Uh, there are uh, many different uh, events going on in this festival. So, there are plenty of opportunities for everyone. Um, I encourage you to participate, of course. And uh, I also encourage you and invite you to come and uh, um, attend the afternoon session with uh, plenary lectures. But now, students are, are key in this morning session. But before we get started, we would like to tell you about uh, this morning's planning. Um, we're going to be uh, hearing uh, from our EDP sponsor. Then there will be uh, time for our guests to answer questions. Pedro Miguel Echenique will be chairing this uh, session. And then, of course, it's up to you to um, ask questions. Are we going to uh, have a draw? And uh, then it will be time for you to ask questions up until half past uh, 11. We are also presenting the price of the best question. That would be up, up until half past 11. And then 
we when we finish our session we'll take another photo at the foyer of this wonderful uh, Victoria Eugenia theatre so that uh, you have a very nice memory of uh, this morning and then of course we're going to have a cafe together and a, a little snack that will give you the chance to talk to our guests it's a very intense morning as you can see three wonderful generous and incredible minds i would like to especially thank our invited scientists for being here ready to share and answer this morning, we are about to meet Professor Len, Professor Sostak, and Professor Ballet Regi. Thank you very much for coming to San Sebastian. Estos encuentros, sin embargo, serían. Uh, this event wouldn't be possible without the support of uh, the sponsors of Donostia International Physics Center, among which uh, there is EDP, supporting these uh, encounters for uh, years now. And uh, we have Ithas Kun Simon, head of the EDP Foundation and Expansion Areas. Uh, the floor is all yours. Madam Simon. Good morning, everyone. I'm honored to be here today in this very special event that highlights scientific research and uh, meeting uh, around scientific research, uh, both professors and students. I would like to thank DIPC for their invitation, and of course, I would also like to thank uh, the uh, attendants, um, both uh, researchers uh, and students, and also professors. The EDP Foundation has been supporting the IPC for a number of years now, but this initiative is especially important for us since it is totally aligned with uh, the main um, commitments of EDP, like fostering education and scientific research among the younger generations. And so uh, we believe it's fundamental to support projects like this one that are committed to creating uh, spaces for encounter and dialogue between science and society. And in this case, we're going to have three guests that are a perfect example of all the possibilities that science uh, brings us uh, when it comes to making headway and uh, increasing the social well-being and welfare. We also have younger researchers that will no doubt play a key role in the future in order to build a fairer and more innovative society. And this is why it's important to motivate our students uh, so that they feel passionate for science and so that they ha apply their critical uh, thinking. Learning shouldn't just limit itself to acquiring theoretical knowledge. It needs to go beyond that. It should stimulate our curiosity, our enthusiasm and the experimentation. What makes us move forward as a society is our interest to search endlessly, uh, look for knowledge and answers. That's precisely what we need to foster here. Nevertheless, there's something we shouldn't forget. Since in Spain, only 16% of uh, professionals uh, in the STEM, science, technology, engineering, and mathematics field, are women. Only 16% are women. And therefore, it's uh, key that we um, apply measures to move forward uh, real uh, equal uh, opportunities for both men and women. Science has never been so close to us as now, but uh, there's still a lot to uh, do and discover. It is your turn uh, now to keep working on the transformation, cooperation and innovation uh, fields. Uh, don't forget that the future is in your hands. We hope that this meeting is going to be very fruitful to you and will show you that the scientific and technological areas have a lot to contribute to us, our society and to the well-being of the people. Thank you very much indeed. Yes, Thank you so much, Ithasco. Thank you for your kind words. Distinguished guests, please, I would like to ask Professor Len, Professor Valetregi, and Professor Sostak to join me on the stage and take their seats together with Professor Echenique. Thank you. 
Maria. Here, please. Yo, Escuche. Está, 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 está atento, por si alguna vez te pido que se te oye, sí. Oh, sí, the light, I don't see anything. <laughs> Need the translation? Yes, yes. <coughs> Perfect. Pedro, sorry. Good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I would like to hand you the floor and, you, uh, of course, your teachers. A few years ago, my daughter. Uh, used to come to these meetings and encounters, and that uh, teacher of her that she loved so much is here today as well. So uh, I see there is a continuity there um, where, and of course, we're very thankful to, thankful to all the teachers that are here today for your work. Um, I will now introduce the speakers. At the end of my introduction, I will give them the floor, just in case they want to add something about what they do. But I guess you know about their biography, their CVs, and the work they've carried out. But, uh, of course, they know things about themselves that uh, we can't even think of, and maybe they want to add something to my short introduction, right? So let me first uh, introduce Professor Jack Fostak, who could be said to be a person who's uh, studying um, the edge of the origin of life. He was uh, he received the Nobel Prize uh, uh, in medicine in 2009 for discovering how repetitive DNA strands known as telomeres protect our chromosomes together with the enzyme telomerase. And currently he's uh, researching into how to create uh, synthetic life on top of understanding the origin of life through the mechanisms that made it possible for uh, chemistry to move into um, biology. The formation of the first molecules um, that have the capacity to auto or to self-replicate -re themselves. Is there anything you would like to add to this very fast introduction? Uh, no, I think that's a, a very good uh, uh, introduction and summary. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Secondly, <laughs> Secondly, we have an old friend, Maria Pallier Regi. He's a bone regenerator. She discovered the potential biomedical application uh, of mesoporous uh, material in the field of uh, um, bone regeneration. Uh, uh, for her pioneering contributions, she received the Reja Primero Award on, the, on basic research in 2018. She's the most cited uh, Spanish scientist in the past two decades. Maria, is there anything you would like to add? Oh. I would like to thank you, Pedro, and all of you for being here. I'm very happy to be here with you today. You. And um, I am lucky uh, because I feel lucky myself because I know this, uh, the next speaker very well. I was going to talk about Didier Querol, the discover, uh, who discovered exoplanets, but I was going to make a mistake. Uh, we have here Jean-Marie Len. Uh, my... <laughs> so, all right, um, let me introduce Jean-Marie Len. I think that together with Sirac, he's the only person who's been, or the only our only guest who's been in all passion for knowledge um, editions somehow. He participated back in 2005. Uh, he works uh, in chemistry. He is king there. He's a symbol in supramolecular chemistry and he advocates science all over the world. He gave us a wonderful talk uh, where people raised to um, applaud him. And let me tell you a little story. Yeah. 
He was working in the old town. I was working in the old town, uh, and uh, someone approached us and said, "Oh, Len, oh, you defended science so well, but don't, didn't you co quote too many people?" He had quoted a German mathematician, Hilbert, and you know, this person in the audience understood Hitler, right? He thought he was quoting Hitler. He made that mistake, and it was it was oh, it was funny, wasn't it? Él él ha estado en todos y ha sido del comité científico. He has been a member of the scientific committee of Nanogune, and he's still there. And among his many distinctions, he's a Nobel uh, laureate uh, for chemistry. He won the award in 1987. 87? Am I right? Yes, I think I'm right. Uh, is there anything you would like to add to this introduction, Jean-Marie? I've been here many times, so, but never with his audience, so let's see what's coming out. Okay, so we go. Okay. Very well, so um, if you uh, all agree, let's now uh, go to uh, the questions. Let me tell you how we're going to be working during these sessions for you to understand uh, um, what the methodology will be. It's very simple, really. You've uh, sent in a total uh, or a maximum of three questions per uh, school uh, in three domains, biographic, uh, biographical questions, scientific technical questions, and general questions. So all these questions have been put in a computer system, and uh, we're going to have a draw, right? Uh, a random uh, draw. We're going to take a number at random belonging to one of these three domains and do you all have a list with different numbers so whenever your number is here up on the screen we're going to be saying uh, what school the question comes from and then i will be asking you to stand up take a mic and ask your question right that's how we're going to be working this morning and so our guests uh, will be answering all your questions this morning. Right, this will be our working methodology up until half past 11. And of, of course, in the meantime, we're going to be uh, giving the prize to the best question. So if you're all ready, and if that's all right with you, let's uh, get started. Uh, start Are you ready? Pedro, if you agree, we can start with a biographical question. Like this, we can get to know a little bit more about our guests today. Okay, let's go. Let's see who's first. Number 20. It's a question we received from uh, the Thumaya BHI um, school in the town of Thumaya. And it's a question for all three guests. And the question is, what is the most important decision you have made in your professional career? Okay, it seems you enjoy it very much. Please first. <laughs> That's a very hard. Uh, that's a very hard question. Um, I think uh, you know I've just sort of moved from question to question. Uh, so maybe it's not actually a, an active decision, but uh, just a sort of decision to think about and study whatever seems like an interesting question at the time, and not focus on just one thing forever. Well, that question can be answered in many different ways. Um, the first good decision I made was not to uh, drop out and uh, not to stop researching because I've, I've been tempted to do so a few times. And as for decisions, um, well, I think that my best decision, you know, I knew some materials, um, 
um, made of uh, silicon, silica, uh, as the, the Concha uh, beach in um, San Sebastian. So they had very small per. Uh, pearl surfaces. These materials has been, have been pa patented to transform alcohols into um, uh, fuel. So we did that in the lab. So instead of alcohol, uh, we used drugs and put drugs in and so arranged the surface of that particle to take the, those drugs to um, the area of the body wherever they, they were necessary. Jean-Marie. Jean-Marie. Okay, my most important decision was right in the first year of university. In high school, we had to choose. The last year high school, you are high school students, I suppose, but to choose between mathematics, experimental science, and philosophy. I chose philosophy because I had been studying Greek and Latin all over. So I wanted to have these big questions which philosophers ask. And uh, then I went to university and I realized, in fact, that uh, philosophy, you have no way to check that what you think is correct. And I then changed to science, especially to chemistry, because chemistry has a way to invent new forms of matter which don't exist yet. I'm more interested in what does not exist than what does already exist. And so I started chemistry science because I felt that I have a control, I can check, whereas philosophy you cannot control, you cannot check, it's just imagination. I'm sorry for the philosophers. <laughs> okay, let's continue. We will choose another biographical question and then we will move on to, to the others. <clears throat> okay. Wow. Number one. You see. <laughs> Number one. It's a question from uh, Arantzazuko Ama School in Donostia, San Sebastian. And the question is for Jack Sostak. And the question is the following. What did you do to get your PhD thesis so early and how did you decide what you wanted to be when you were so young? Yes, So I had always been interested in science from when I was very young. So I studied uh, biology and a little bit of chemistry in college. Um, the reason I got started at a fairly young age is because uh, my parents kept moving from one school system to another and, and uh, ended up skipping ahead several grades. Uh, so that allowed me to get a fast start. Uh, and uh, I think I would have gotten my PhD actually much faster if I hadn't made some mistakes early on. And uh, it, uh, my first three years in graduate school were actually extremely difficult. I almost dropped out of science because things failed <laughs> so much. But uh, in the end, I guess if you're persistent and lucky, uh, then things work out. And uh, I was able to uh, finally do an experiment that worked and uh, get my PhD. Maybe a general question now? Yeah. 94. This is from Coldo Michelena School in Vitoria Gasteiz. And this is a question. It's a question for all three guests. Uh, how do you see the role of science and research in today's society and its importance in dealing with global challenges such as public health and the environment? Okay, Jamari. Jamari? I am 
maybe not in line with this question. I think that when you do research, when you look for knowledge, there are no barriers, there cannot be imposed anything having to do about public health, environment. These are social questions, they are not questions of knowledge. So I think basic research should first look about new knowledge, about truth, and the rest comes after that. I'm sorry, it's not in line with what one thinks today, but I strongly advocate that. I'm sure that history has proven that this is the best possible way to solve uh, problems, right? I mean, no, no. sometimes you have also practical approaches which can help be helpful, and society suggests things too. But I think the way we should operate in trying to gain the quest for knowledge is a quest which should not be limited by goals which are not scientific and not have nothing to do with knowledge and truth. I know I'm old minded, but I hang on to it. <laughs> I think uh, I don't totally agree with that. I think you need well, to we'll have, have a discussion a, from the beginning. Can discuss. You need to have a balance, right? Obviously, the world is facing huge problems, so we have to devote resources to solving those problems. But we also, as Jean Marie said, we have to have. Uh, uh, the ability to explore, you know, any, all kinds of questions where we might not understand right now the, what, what they will lead to. Uh, we're just you know, curious about how the world works, and often it's answers to those kinds of questions that eventually have the biggest impact. So we need a balance between really fundamental science and applied science. I am less in favor of a balance. But I may say I admire, for instance, cosmologists yes. who can convince governments to put billions of dollars into things you never see. <laughs> but we have knowledge. Yes. Gravitational waves, who worries about gravitational waves? Huh? I, I totally agree. I, I, I wish that uh, I was as good as those physicists at bringing billions That's of dollars true. into my very field. Good. <laughs> <laughs> physicists are very good. Now, now the synthesis, Maria. Bueno, yo... Well, I totally, yeah, I agree with both of them, but I think that um, basic science always leads us to applied science. Uh, if the basis, basic science is good, it will lead us to applied science. So when did we discover new things and we have new tools, I like to see that that has an impact on society. I develop biomaterials, so I like to see that anything that we discover in uh, a, our lab reaches patients in, in a hospital, right? I think that good science always has an application, a direct, direct application for society as a whole, in my case, for patients. But we all have examples of physics, right? Uh, uh, and discoveries that at a given point in time could have been seen as just a um, tiny discovery and they've led to the current technology. So I think that uh, both things are very closely related. Let me take this privilege as a, a chair to not uh, moderate myself and uh, also share my opinion. I think that uh, the past teaches us that uh, Apparently, useless um, steps have been very, very useful, actually. Um, of course, there are aspects in cosmology, for instance, very well uh, mentioned by uh, Jean-Marie, or many things that uh, will not be uh, useful, but science is uh, an essential, a key part of uh, modern humanism and uh, the search, the quest for knowledge, and this cultural economic side of things and this social side of things are there. All three of them are pretty much aligned, and I think that in some fields, and I agree with Len, in some fields there is too much pressure to direct people in one direction, right, to, to meet the needs of the markets or whatever. And I think it is our mission as scientists to release science from uh, an excessive uh, functional approach, right? I think that uh, um, 
we may not get anything from all type of knowledge, but if we have good knowledge in a field, I'm sure that new things will come that will help us in other fields. So, well, this is a very nice um, discussion. I agree with them, but we need to release science from this uh, functional approach. And we shouldn't tell scientists what they need to do. They need to be free to formulate, to ask the questions they want to ask and answer them in the best possible way. Okay, we're going to go with a scientific technical question now. Question number 67 from Urechu Zumarraga y Castola, so the Urechu Zumarraga School. And it is a question for Jack Sostak. Um, your work helped to further study chromosomal recombination and telomeric function, a breakthrough with molecular biology. Do you expect to change the paradigms within your scientific area? Uh, no, not at all. Uh, when, we were, when we were studying uh, these problems of uh, DNA repair and uh, telomere function, it was, uh, it was a, a, a puzzle, something interesting that was not well understood. Uh, and the implications, the broader implications, only emerged later, o over time. Uh, and uh, in fact, you know, recombination turned out to be so complicated. Uh, many people are still working on it. It turned out to be very important in understanding, uh, you know, various genetic diseases or things like cancer. But at the time, we had. We, we had no idea. We, we weren't interested in it from that kind of like biomedical application. We were only uh, trying to figure out how the process uh, worked in, inside cells, which was, which was very mysterious uh, back then. Thank you. Another scientific one? Yes. Otra pregunta científica? Sostak again. 62. Mm. 62 from La Salle in Legazpi. And it's a question for Maria Valiet Regi. How did you find out that silica had the power to transport drugs to tumors? Did you discover it or did somebody else do it? <laughs> and how did it occur to you that it was capable of transporting medicine? And how did these nanoparticles penetrate the body? It's more than one question, but there we go. Okay, well, let's just, you know, uh, I'll try to answer all the different parts of the question. I can't see you. Where are you? Where's the person that asked me the question? Right, well, if I don't answer all your questions, then just ask me the question again. Right, silica. Um, it's biocompatible, and so it can be put into the human body. Um, and that's the important thing about silica. But let me just tell you something. If you're going to have a, a seafood fest, for example, if you're just going to, I don't know, in a couple of beers, if we drink a couple of beers, we're going to put more silica into our bodies than we will with a nanoparticle, because nanoparticles are really, really small. So it was... A very small quantity, which means it doesn't matter if it goes into your body. And uh, I think I've already said this, I think when I answered the first question, about why I was studying this. Well, I've been working on nanoparticles in the field of nanoparticles. Uh, I've been working on silica in general as well. Why? Because this was way back in the 1980s, and there was an oil crisis in the world at the time. And so we were looking for alternatives to try to uh, find alternatives to petrol. Uh, sort of a kind of fuel that uh, didn't depend on oil. Uh, so that the Americans weren't going to dominate everything. Now there were some materials. Uh, there are different types of silica uh, materials that have pores which you can 
inject a bit of al different types of alcohols in them. I'm sure you've all studied this, right? There's um, different types of base acids there, and these alcohols uh, can uh, bind to form octanes, which is basically petrol. But uh, we have met methanol, but in fact we found methanol, but methanol was more expensive than petrol, so that wasn't a good business proposition, really. And many scientists all over the world were working to try to make these pores bigger so that we could put larger alcohol molecules in them. And I was working on that as well. But then I think it was in 1991, 1992, the Mobile Corporation in the United States found the formula, uh, which are now called uh, silica mesoporous, meso, meso, mesoporous uh, materials. Uh, they found the way to uh, put all these things around it, and then they took the template out, and they just ended up with a uh, mesoporous material. Uh, with a large enough uh, pore to enable methanol to be put in or, or many different substances. So once that happened, uh, there was an explosion of research and they were all started working on catalysis. So I had actually moved from the, chemi the chemistry faculty to the med medical faculty at the time. And I thought, okay, well, instead of alcohol, why don't we put drugs into these pores and then we can have a controlled release of these drugs in the human body. And there I was the first, the first one. That's what you asked me, right? I wasn't the first person to discover mesoporous materials, but I was the first person to actually use that for controlled drug release. And if you put different types of drugs in, you can put all sorts. You can put antibiotics in, anti-cancer drugs. You can put any type of drugs because the uh, drug molecules just measure one nanometer and the diameter of uh, these pores about uh, two nanometers. So you can, you know, put quite a, a lot of them in and you can actually get a quite a, a high load. So that was another explosion uh, which opened up a whole new avenue of research and a lot of people are pursuing that avenue of research now. How can uh, we eject that into the human body? Well, in the, we can put it into the bloodstream, and then they go and find the tumour. And how do we know, how do they know where to go? Well, if we know what sort of tumour we're looking for on the surface of these nanoparticles, we can add molecules that will direct them straight to the tumour. I'm not sure if I've answered all your questions. If I've sort of left something behind, please let me know. I think that uh, the question was, was it you who uh, discovered that? No, well, not alcohol, but drugs. Yes, I was the first person. Uh, it, was, it was a technology that had been patented by the Mobile Corporation, but I used it to transport drugs. Another one now, maybe uh, scientific or general or general. We want a general one now. Number 93, uh, from Carmengo Ama School in Pasaya. And it's a question for all three of our guests. And the question is, What made you want to be a scientist? Jean-Marie? I said that I'm we'll, very we'll be, interested. We'll be very happy to hear it again. <laughs> very good. Thank you, sir. Uh, no, I was much more interested in philosophy because it deals with these large problems. But as I said, you have no way to check what a philosophical theory or analysis has as truth. No way to check. So I became a scientist because that is, was the other part. In fact, it was a bit more complicated because in France, at that time at least, if you wanted to study philosophy, you had in your curriculum to have one scientific exam. And so I said, okay, let's start with science, so I still have the choice. So I was undecided, 
I didn't decide very early. I was undecided until the, you know, the first, well, it's not, okay, it was not very much advanced at that stage, but the first year at university. So that made me a scientist, and then I became very rationalist, very strongly, because that's the thing that counts. Emotions are fine, but emotions don't bring you any truth. Typically French, I would say. <laughs> so it took me a while to figure out really what I wanted to do. Actually, when I started in college, I was probably more interested in mathematics, but eventually that became too abstract for me, and I was more interested in things you could see and touch and puzzles that you could think about and actually solve in the lab with the experiments. And then what really got me permanently hooked as a scientist was the fact that when you find something new, when you see something for the very first time that no one has ever seen before, it's an incredible feeling. <laughs> and, uh, and then uh, that sort of drove me to keep uh, trying to think about and understand new things. I think that's something that uh, a scientific career, uh, that's the kind of opportunity that you have in a career in science that's hard to get any other way. Maria. Jump. Maria? In my case, I didn't uh, find out what I wanted to do so early on. I didn't really know what I wanted to do until after I finished my university degree. At that time, uh, it, in Spain at least, it, uh, the degree was really boring. I got so bored during my career. It was just, oh, it was all heavy and, well, oh, the teachers, the lecturers weren't particularly good, to say the least. They weren't, I don't think they were top of their class in any of the classes that they'd been in, so I got really bored during my degree. But I really like lab work. So uh, I took the opportunity to just try out what it was like to work in a laboratory. And I really like discovering new things. It's fantastic. The first thing, the first time you find, you know, something new, you find out you make a discovery. It's an amazing feeling. You think you're just the king or the queen of the world. I really like that feeling. It's great. It's very addictive. And uh, they rec I, I was recommended well, no, to do my thesis. Uh, the, f the funding for, for my thesis uh, came from a company in Bilbao called Donkinesa, which made paint. And they had a problem that the white paint just became yellow uh, over time. And they wanted the white paint to stay white for longer. And so they gave me uh, that uh, theme, that topic, to research. So there was a sort of a basic research part, but an applied research part. And I like that combination, the combination of basic and applied research, because I like to find out new things, but I also like to see that what I'm doing actually has an application in the real world. You know? And uh, that actually helped someone pay for my thesis as well, because it had an actual application for a company, which is uh, always a good advantage. If you help them solve their problem, they give you a scholarship and otherwise they wouldn't. So there I combined both things. And that's what I've done throughout the rest of my life, really. Because I think that basic research, discovering new things, that's just the best thing ever. But you should never be in a hurry. Because some things... Uh, have a, uh, an application immediately, you can see that. But other things, it might take years, it might even take centuries for someone to work out, oh, look, that could actually be used for this. So I think that both pathways are equally valid, and that's what's always motivated me. I had good teachers, good lecturers and great books, and I loved solving problems. I didn't have such good labs, which is why I became a theorist. But you, all of you, you have fantastic teachers. You have great books these days. I mean, I mean, you know, the, the maths 
textbooks that I had to put up with when I was at high school. It was, oh, they were terrible. You'd hate them if you, you know, it would, really, they were like huge treaties on mathematics. Your, your mathematics textbooks are much better, so you're very lucky. Make the most of it. Can I say something else? You can say as much as you like, Maria. You cannot imagine, you won't be able to even imagine how lucky you are, you've no idea, because science has an education and, and teachers, in fact, have progressed so much in Spain over uh, the last 50 years. Because, I mean, let me tell you, before, there were no textbooks. It was all, you had to take notes. Uh, teachers had little, little yellow cards, I don't know, but I think they were probably white at the beginning, but they were yellow by the time that my teacher was using them. And now, you've got so many books available. Well, I'm talking about now, but I mean, this has been the case for about 30 years now. There are so many books, and they're fantastic books. And everyone can get hold of them. And, you know, your teachers are much better trained these days. You're really, really lucky, all of you. I'm so jealous of you all. And in the Basque country, uh, we're really lucky because we never had textbooks in Basque before, and now we have fantastic textbooks in Basque and in Spanish, and you can choose which one you want to read. I would just like to add that taking notes is very good too. Also, yeah, I agree with that. Because yeah. then you have to, in fact, you have to make an effort to write it down. Yeah. So I don't like too much things only on computers. No, no, computer, no. But in fact, Jean-Marie is a proof of that because in all the lectures here, in Passion for Knowledge, he is taking notes. <laughs> Sometimes. <laughs> Thank you. Maria. Eso es cierto, pero tienes que... That's true, but you need to have someone who's actually giving you a good talk so that you can take notes, because if they're, you know, talking rubbish, it's really difficult to take notes. Because in my curriculum <laughs> at the university, I redid all the courses. I did not go to all the courses. I knew the topic, and then I took books to do the course. So you had to work by yourself. And nowadays, too many, especially students at the university, they rely on the course. And if they get a question at the exam, which is, was not in the course, they said, oh, that should not be asked. No. You have to learn your job, and this depends on you. It depends on you. You have to use the books. <laughs> you have to, to finalize your, your own knowledge so that you cover the field, and not just what the, what the teacher told you. The yes, teacher may not uh, have the time. Oh, it's fantastic. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I love what uh, Jean-Marie said. Uh, one of the things that made me the most happy when I went to college is I didn't have to go to the lectures. Most of the lectures were terrible, and I had a much better uh, education going to the library exactly. and reading books and papers that? and yeah. studying. And, and then, yeah, the, the exams are easy if you understand no. what's going on. Okay, well, we wouldn't say that teachers should be terrible, but if they are, <laughs> you have a way out. Yes. <laughs> and you learn a lot. In cualquier caso, es maravilloso ver que And it's wonderful to see that people who are at the top of the knowledge tree disagree. It's great that they disagree with each other, that they can argue and debate things, but we have to let students ask their questions. So perhaps we should come up with a new session, uh, which will be called Discussions Between Lecturers and Teachers. Maybe we should just come up with a whole new session. No, I completely, I completely agree with you, Jean-Marie. But, you perhaps don't know this, but here in Spain, there, was, uh, no, there were no books, there were no scientific libraries. It was a desert, basically. So you, could, you had the luxury of not going to class because you had a good library and good books, but we didn't have that luxury. That was what I was trying to say. So basically the conclusion is that we need to invest in science and research and libraries and books so that uh, students have the opportunity to develop their imagination in any way they choose. Now, can we please have another question? <laughs> Biological? Yeah, whichever one you like. Okay, off we go. Number 19. 
Again, another question from Urrechu and Zumarra, the school in Urrechu and Zumarra. And it's a question for everyone. Are recognition and re are the recognition and rewards you have received, were they your goal or are they simply the result of your eternal passion for your work? So were they your goal or was it just a happenstance? Never a goal. I, I never thought that what we were doing, you know, uh, when we were studying telomeres would ever lead to any recognition. It was just because we were curious about uh, a scientific puzzle and... Um, the implications and all the awards and everything came 25 years later. We had no idea at the time that we were doing the work. There's a simple answer um, that the recognition was not the goal, that we published more papers after my Nobel Prize than before that. <laughs> So we didn't lose interest. <laughs> Maybe it comes the second Nobel Prize. Sorry? Maybe uh, of That's those papers... again. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, yo, yo desde el... no, I mean, not only have I not pursued uh, prizes, but they always have come as a surprise. Uh, as a gift, really, that's how I've always looked at them, because there are so many scientists who do so much great work, and when there are, are so many people out there, you, it's not often your turn. Well, it's been great every time I've won a prize. I mean, don't get me wrong, I've loved it, but it was never my goal. Now, let me add one, something Please. to that. It's not that we are not interested in prizes. This would be wrong to say, because we are all interested in when you get one. But the prize is more a recognition of what you have done. And this is because the community of scientists has judges, for instance, for the Nobel Prize, the community of scientists nominating you, and then it comes out. And so the first feeling is what we did, what I did, is was it because the others recognize it. In some cases, of course, others have not recognized that there are some very late Nobel Prizes for instance, Barbara McClintock, who got the prize 30, 40 years, and uh, good enough, John, good enough, I, I think, yeah, yeah. 50 years Same. after uh, yeah. uh, he did his work, uh, and a long, long career, he was the, uh, old, the oldest Nobel Prize winner 99, ever. I think, 99, no? for, 98, the lead, for the batteries, for the batteries. It was 98. Eight, or 98, old. maybe. Yeah. So, uh, well, good enough, good enough. No, no? We, we don't. Uh, if it, I think you, one shouldn't, that would not, would not be honest to say that we don't like it. Of course we like it, but it's not the goal. I want to add a question to that a question. When you get the Nobel Prize young enough or important prizes, it's not only the recognition, it is that that gives you the opportunity, it's an instrument to do new things, to develop new groups, to have more means. Would you agree with that? Yeah, that ha that's true. For instance, I wouldn't be at, probably at passion for knowledge otherwise. <laughs> <laughs> you are counting on that, you're exploiting. You, are, you wouldn't be a passion for knowledge probably if I wouldn't have been Principe Asturias Prize. I think so. <laughs> well, probably you will have been anyhow, in any, anyway, because, anyway, or, or okay. <laughs> okay, another question now, a general question this time. Question 100. So we had one and a uh, hundred. The probability that the, among 200 questions, one and hundred appeared. <laughs> That's the Arancha? No, I don't want to, uh, to bother you now, but we will think about that. Okay. Well. So it's from Udarregi School in Usurbil, and it is a question for all of you. If you could go back to being our age with your current knowledge, would you change anything about your life? And if you would, what would that thing be? Maria. Uh, I would enjoy studying more, as I said before, right, at school and at uni, 
Uh, I didn't feel particularly motivated, but I would do now. Because if I could go back and study now with the books you have now, the teachers and lecturers you have now, I'm sure I would learn all sorts of different things. And maybe I'd have not chosen chemistry. I, maybe I would have ended up studying something else. I would have really liked to have had the possibilities that you have when I was young. I really feel like I've been so incredibly lucky throughout my career that I've been able to think about and study any questions that I wanted to, and uh, so I would definitely I wouldn't change anything about that. <laughs> I love what I'm doing, and I would just keep doing what I'm doing. Yeah, very good. Yeah, Marie. I would like to start again, but with the knowledge I have now. <laughs> yeah, that was the smart answer, wasn't it? I, I would disagree because it's the thrill of discovery. If you knew, if you were starting with what you knew now, you might not have the same thrill of discovering new things. I'm uh, not so sure. I might like to study cosmology, for instance. No, irías más para arriba. Or uh, you will discover new biology, claro. people in a different biology, field. Biology, sure. stem cells. There's a lot of things. Architecture. So many things. When you go to to uh, Bilbao, <laughs> the architecture <laughs> has changed the city. An architect has a very big power on Same. the relationships in the whole city, all of the people. And how many things in life? M music. I would like to. So you, you to play. like chemistry change things, you want to change things as well. You no, want, I still would be you, you want to change the world. Yeah. That all, <laughs> all of us want to do that. So ah, yeah, yeah. That's not original. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is getting a fantastic question time, but the students need it. <laughs> okay. Sure. Okay, so another biographical question now. Number 10. We've had one, ten, and a hundred. This is a question for Maria Vallet. Why did you decide to study biology? Was it something you knew you wanted to do for a long time, or was it a spontaneous decision? I didn't study biology, I studied chemistry. I am a chemist by training. But then when I started uh, researching nanoparticles and, uh, and biomaterials uh, and trying to find a way of introducing them into uh, the human body, I realized I didn't know anything about physiology. So I started working in the field of biology much later. This was, we're talking about 1990. Before that, I worked on uh, magnetic materials, superconductors, and I worked with physicists, but I was a chemist. But then when I started to work with biomaterials and nanomedicine, that was when I started to work with physicians, with doctors, and I had to learn biology, but I am actually a chemist by training. Bueno, eta aprobetxatzen duela bigaldera sariei buruz hitz egiten egon garela. Zoriondu nahi zaituzte gu. So, now we've been talking about awards. I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate all of you students for the wonderful questions you've sent in. And now we're going to reveal which question is the winning question? Because only one question is going to win the EDP prize. It's a shame because all of them deserve it. But I'm going to ask Ifastun to come back up onto the stage to announce which question has won the EDP prize. And the prize goes to question number. 21. This question 
was sent in by Maria Aspiasu e Janet from the Aldapeta Maria School in Donostia, San Sebastian. So, Maria, please, can you join us here on the stage? Congratulations, Maria. We're going to take a photo, right? First of all, and then you can ask your question. For the, we, we will do a... Can you please stand up to take a picture with Maria? Thank you. Oh, damn it. Thank you very much. Congratulations, Maria. So they say telomeres protect the tips of chromosomes from degradation. Some researchers are trying to extend chromosomes in order to rejuvenate people. Is this possible? And what ethical problems are linked to this? So uh, the problem is that there's a, a kind of balance between regeneration, which might allow more tissue regeneration, uh, theoretically allow, uh, contribute to longer life. But at the same time, this helps tumors to grow, right? If the telomere ends keep elongating, then the cells in the tumor can keep dividing. And so there's the danger that you have more likelihood to develop cancer when you're trying to extend life. So it's, that's what makes it a very difficult but interesting problem. Thank you. <laughs> Congratulations again, Maria. I mean, the ethical problem yeah, is you, you can don't add want to whatever you want. <laughs> okay. The ethical problem is you don't want to cause, you don't want to hurt people when you're trying to develop something that helps. Fine then, so uh, after this uh, short uh, interruption to uh, present this prize, we still have an hour to ask uh, more questions. Uh, just uh, don't worry if you didn't have the opportunity to ask your question because there will be time for that. Um, let's move on to the scientific and uh, technical questions now. Number 72. That, uh, from the Thumaya School. And uh, this is the question. Uh, what is the future of chemistry? In other words, given that the number of elements and their possible combinations are limited, what will be the possible future directions of chemistry in the production of new materials? Just maybe designing new elements? Producing new elements? There are no new elements. They are all known. Well, there are no new elements. Visible matter has the natural elements and you have none else. But you can make an infinite number of combinations because the length is not limited. The, the, the building blocks are limited, but not how many you use and how you dispose them. That's the way it is. Huh? It's very strange. It's even perturbing to say that uh, we are in a universe where the visible matter of which we are made is a, sex, uh, is a set of elements and there are no others. No. <laughs> you don't like it. I don't like it either. 
It's very strange. It's disappointing. But your universe is made that way. There are other universes, perhaps, but there are more. But I don't think we have a good chance to get there, at least not in a reasonable amount of time. You can make, of course, you can prolongate, you can make the periodic table longer, but the elements are still elements, of course, artificial. They don't exist in nature, but they are built on the same types of particles. Maybe in a black hole, there are other particles. But okay, that's another question. If you go down the black hole, there was a, a famous uh, scientist from Princeton who gave a talk down the black hole. <laughs> you know this John Archibald Wheeler, I think yeah, it was. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that was it was a very successful talk. And the other talk was the Beyond Beyond the End of Time. It was also a good title. You can make a movie with that one. <laughs> For the philosophy class. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I completely agree. I think actually m many of the most interesting questions in chemistry uh, <coughs> still have to do with the most simple and common elements, <coughs> carbon, nitrogen, oxygen. Yeah. Uh, to understand, I mean, what I'm interested in, how life got started, it's questions of chemistry with, uh, you know, very simple building blocks. And we still don't understand how things uh, sort of uh, reacted and came together to give us biology. And maybe one can add something else to this, that uh, all sort of processes which exist no, in our universe. <laughs> which exist in no, our no, universe. No. Sorry? No, no, please, please. The processes which exist, <laughs> probably our universe is organized, self-organized, and that is something which happens on the principle of thermodynamics, the structure of our universe. So in some cosmologists even say that in the Big Bang, all we are doing is already contained. Sitting here today, that's always already there, the Big Bang programmed at the beginning. Some people advocate that. I'm not so sure, but okay. I cannot say no, because in science you cannot negate anything unless you have a proof. Maria? Bueno. Yes, um, um, I am a solid state chemist, and in that field, well, I can't give you any figures now, but you can make uh, your own calculations by yourselves uh, very well. Um, I can tell you that the elements of, uh, in the periodic table are more than 100, 100 and odd elements. There are some artificial ones, but if we take even a short uh, periodic table, uh, you can carry out this, uh, some some, an exercise, right, to see how many um, possibilities are there. If you take the elements one by one or two by two, you get a number of possible combinations. I don't know this by heart, but you can calculate this. But if you take them three by three, you get a much um, higher, uh, greater number. And if you take them four by four, it would be larger, right? Um, if you take niodymium and borom, um, well, uh, in the 20th century, we didn't know much about them. They have three limits, but there are many more that could be discovered. And if you take four, the superconductors, for instance, yttrium, barium, copper, oxygen, the four, there are four of them, and they were discovered, well, we, they were discovered back in the 80s, and we could discover many more, many more combinations, so combinations of five elements, you know, uh, so this would lead you to more than five million possible combinations with four elements. So in solid state uh, chemistry, and I say solid state because in, in molecular is different, but I know that if we combine the elements in solid state uh, chemistry, um, we get more and more numbers of combinations, depending on, on uh, whether you take the elements two by two, three by three, four by four, and you in the future and your offspring can uh, probably come to many more combinations. Yes, well, uh... there is uh, a, um, a singer, Tom Lehrer, who has heard that. He has the tape, you know, some people have seen. You know? Tom Lehrer, you can find him on internet, uh, a presentation he had in Copenhagen. 
and he sings the periodic table <laughs> in a disordered way. It's quite, uh, quite fantastic. But then he ends up at the end and said, yeah, things have become complicated. It was my, very much simpler when Aristotle was there, because it was air, water, fire, and earth. That's it. <laughs> Four elements on <coughs> in, in the <laughs> Well, I like this discussion we're having here. And uh, if I had to summarize science in two concepts, I would choose, first of all, the ultimate constituents of matter are a few, and they are ruled by highly symmetrical laws. But in the world of things, you know, the world of things is infinite because there are infinite possible combinations. And if we look at the periodic table, we have infinite possibilities, quite simply because the Hilbert space is infinite or because of the possibilities we have, the periodic system is broad, very large. And I would also add that Mr. Manuel de Irujo, a great Basque minister in the Republic, used to say that the Basque people should be proud because at least they've made one discovery, unlike the French or Americans that have made infinite contributions to science. They discovered tungsten in Bergara, in the town of Bergara, in the Basque country. This is why Bergara is a European city for science, and that's an achievement in the Basque country, almost as important as uh, football matches uh, between different teams in different provinces in the Basque country that are so important to people. And that uh, achievement was possible thanks to Ricardo Díaz de Muño and DIPC. So thank you very much. Well, shall we get uh, more questions? Biographical questions, maybe? This? Yeah, good. Number 14. This is a question from Peña Florida in, uh, School uh, in Donostia, in San Sebastian, and it is a question for Jack Sostak. And the question is, did you make any, many decisions in your career that you thought were wrong at the time, but that you today are proud uh, to have made? Yes, that I thought were wrong at the time. Uh, I certainly made a lot of decisions that were wrong at the time, uh, um, especially in some of the things that I wanted to do scientifically at the beginning. Um, I think the, the thing that I guess, uh, not proud is maybe not the right word, but at least I learned from those mistakes, right? I learned that uh, it's important to choose the right questions to think about. For example, there are many interesting questions that are, uh, you know, not something that can be answered at this time if we don't have the technology or the support. So I learned that, uh, you know, it's very important. I learned through my mistakes in choosing the wrong questions to actually think about questions that are both interesting and that can be answered. And that's much more fulfilling if you choose the wrong question. It'll just be frustrating and you won't get anywhere. Uh, but if you choose something where you can talk to people, where there's the right technology, you can make an advance. I think, yeah. Jean-Marie? Question? Uh, maybe, you know, sometimes you make an error and you change field. And that's a good decision. But this is the opposite. Sometimes the question is, you think you, you got it wrong and you give up an idea, and many years later you realize that it was wrong to give up the idea. That happens too. OK. But uh, when sometimes you, you make an error and you say, OK, let's drop it and do something else. And that can be very important because the new thing may be much more interesting than the old one. Yeah. Okay. Sure, there are all, all kinds of possibilities. Maria? Well, I think that uh, you learn a lot from mistakes. 
because you realize what it is that you don't have to do or what it is that you've done wrongly and then you change direction at a given point in time. So I think that uh, mistakes are ways uh, to learn, uh, help you to learn new things. Uh, in our papers we include the positive outcomes but we should include the negative ones or the failures because you learn a lot from that. And you prevent other people from making the same mistake. Scientific technical question now. 27 from the Ashular uh, School. This is a question for all three uh, of our guests. And the question is, is there only one definition of life? And uh, what does that word mean to you? Thank you. Okay, you. This, so this is a question that comes up all the time in my field, which is uh, studying the origin of life. And so a lot of times people say, well, how can you study this if you don't have a definition of life? And to me, this is, kind of a distraction because the word life applies to so many different things. It's, 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 it's not a word that has a, a single unique meaning. In, in the scientific questions that we're studying, we're looking for a path from chemistry to biology. And the different places on that pathway, you know, some people may say, well, this is where you have life, or maybe later on, this is where life begins. To me, that is kind of a distraction from the interesting question, which is uh, trying to understand the path f that leads from chemistry to biology. Now, life is, you know, also applied to many other things, right? I mean, any conscious entity you would say is alive, but it's not related to the questions of the emergence of, for example, of Darwinian evolution, where we could have, perhaps we will very soon have computer systems that we say are alive because they're thinking, self-aware, conscious beings. It's a completely different concept and the fact that the same word is used to describe these very different things I think leads to a lot of confusion. Thank you. Maria? Well, a very difficult question, indeed. Well, I think that uh, my colleague's answer is a very good one, so I'll leave it at that. I think the more in interesting thing, life is only beginning. It's a thinking, which is the next step. And that is much more complicated than discovering how life evolved and what life is. Because without thinking, we would not be here. And their life is not very much interesting. I wouldn't like to be a mushroom, for instance, which is a living system, huh? Well, would this you like to be a brings mushroom? Me back to one of the earlier questions. If I was starting over again with what I know now, I might be studying the origin of the mind. Yeah, exactly. That is a big question for the future. That's the, that's the question. <laughs> I agree yeah. with you. Bio. Bio. Biological question? Yes, and then a general one, please. Yeah. Okay, we've got time for more questions. So, question number 16 for everyone from La Asunción School. Can you please stand up so we can see you? Thank you. Hello, my question is um, the following. Were the stu studies you were carrying out aimed at achieving the objective you have achieved? Or on the contrary, were you aiming for something different in your research and then you simply made this discovery for some other reason? Well, the studies I was carrying out were not at all aimed at achieving 
the objective that we achieved. We had no idea it, that came much later. So for me, the research I carry out now, which I think is the most important one I've carried out in my life, because at first we, you know, I, I went from one uh, question to another, from one project to another. I had to go uh, to a foreign country because we didn't even have uh, ovens and furnaces or material to carry out research. It was a hard time. And I think that what I'm doing now is what really makes me feel good. This is what I like to do. Uh, but of course, back then, I wouldn't uh, have imagined uh, that I would be doing this because I didn't have the technology, the material, the lab. So the research work I carry out now have a very different uh, direction if you compare it with uh, my early research. And that's the reason, because I didn't have the means, the resources I needed. But now, uh, since um, the 1990s, or maybe the 80s, I've had enough resources and tools, and I've been able to um, make some discoveries. Jean-Marie? Jean-Marie? Let's assume that there are no limitations in apparatus and so on. But we all function differently. We have different ways of approaching things. I am rather sort of logical developments. And for instance, uh, I was interested, as I told you, in philosophy. Now, philosophy is where? In the mind. The mind is where? In the nervous system. So at that time, I asked myself, can a chemist in 1965, 60, yeah, 65, can a chemist contribute to this enormously complicated problem of the functioning of a nervous system? And I looked for something simple. Chemists are simple persons, simple people. And say something very simple, the action potential along a nerve de depends on sodium potassium ions go through membranes. This is called the action potential. I said, okay, sodium potassium, know what it is, that's accessible for a chemist. And so uh, there must be molecules which distinguish between sodium and potassium. And so let's make molecules which can pick up either sodium or potassium selectively. And that was the beginning of our work, because the next step was to recognize that that was a proof. The molecules which are able to distinguish sodium from potassium, two spheres with very slightly different radii, then this is a recognition. So then you think about molecular recognition. And you think then about molecular recognition, yeah, sure, but this depends on interaction between objects. And then you think about supramolecular chemistry, and so on. Sort of logical steps. So it, that sounds like a very logical step-by-step -step progression, but uh, to me, when you, you can study one thing, you can, uh, say, learn about, for example, in my case, nucleic acids, because you're doing one thing, maybe trying to solve some biological question like DNA repair, but then it opens the door to studying something completely different, and we started looking at evolutionary questions and discovering how RNA molecules can bind targets, completely unexpected. So I think one of the charming things about science is that when you find, you learn about one area, it opens a door to study something completely different. That's an option. You, you want to add something, Jeffrey? No, it's an option. It's just, uh, you know, it's different. We function differently. I like logical derivatives. And, of course, there are many other things on the side which you discover when you make progress. For instance, molecular recognition, that is drug design. A drug is a recognition between one molecule you make in a lab with a biological target. So that's drug design also. Supermolecular chemistry has to do with interactions between molecules, the whole world of interactions. So, so very well. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I'll pick a scientific one. Forty. Forty. 
This question comes from our Tsaro school. It's question number 47. Since you're an expert in molecules and particle connections, do you think that with the contributions of chemistry and the important work you are carrying out, you're going to be able to contribute to the theory of everything that scientists are currently looking for, or a similar theory, maybe? A theory of everything. Yeah, this is in the hands of physicists, not in the hands of chemists. Physics deals with the fundamental laws of the universe, and the theory of everything is a physical theory. Of course, without life and without, without chemistry and life, you would not have the physicists. They wouldn't exist. So, <laughs> so they still depend on the fact that they exist. But I am personally convinced that our universe has certain laws. Everything functions following that, those laws. And the theory of everything is in the hand of the physicists. It's not necessarily funny. It's not necessarily reassuring. And look, it's also a question of diversity. Um, when uh, let me, I compare. I, let, I, I used one of my papers. The uh, when there was the uh, the uh, some kind, there was an anniversary of uh, in chemistry, and the physicist asked me to write something a page on. on on uh, the stand of chemistry at that time. And I said, what is chemistry to physics? The relationship between physics and chemistry is like between the laws of acoustics and the Beethoven symphony. <laughs> Beethoven symphony is acoustics. <laughs> but the laws of acoustics don't contain all of it, all the possible expressions. So that is my answer to that question. So, Jean-Marie, the theory of everything will tell us nothing about everything interesting. That could be. <laughs> <laughs> but that is not my business. That's your business, physicists. Uh, I think Anderson said that uh, when he discussed uh, emergence. Okay. Uh, Shall we pick another question? 41 in this case. For Maria uh, from Ginza School. And the question is What ethical and regulatory problems or obstacles exist in your work with regard to the manufacture of medical elements, organs, uh, using 3D printing? Well, with 3D printing, what we uh, make is a scaffolds to then carry out tissue engineering. And um, there must be... Be, they must be biocompatible with uh, our body, non-toxic, of course. They need to be biocompatible, that's essential. And uh, then, uh, well, uh, the, the uh, tissues need to go uh, through uh, in vivo anti vitro tests before they get to patients. So there's a whole system there um, before we can u actually use these elements. A general question now. 81, number 81, from Hernani, and it's for all three of you. Sometimes in the lives of scientists and researchers, projects and research fail during the research process. Assuming this has happened to you, what have you learned from this experience? I think I tried to address that before. 
many, in fact, <coughs> mo most things that you try are probably not going to work out. And so then you have to at, make a difficult decision uh, often as to whether to continue to pour time and energy into something that's not working or uh, give up on that and go in some more, hopefully more productive direction. That's a very hard decision uh, to make. Uh, and it depends a lot on, uh, you know, having uh, people to bounce ideas across, uh, trying to decide whether, what the limitation is, you know, is it technological, something that can be solved, or is there some more fundamental barrier to making progress in one direction, dimension? Um, so I think part of, being a good or successful scientist is understanding when to give up on something that's not working and go in a new direction. But that's, it's, it's very hard to do. Sure. I think that's the, the most difficult thing, probably. Huh? My, for me, the worst month in the year is August, when everybody's on holidays. Because then I use all the, I look at all the research projects we are pursuing and ask myself the question, is it worth doing this? And that's very, very difficult. Sometimes you have to quit, but if you quit, you cannot find a solution to that. And some people have been hanging on. And there are these questions, that is Katalin Carico, who just got the Nobel Prize for the COVID, with Drew Weissman for the COVID-19 vaccine. She was a tenacious person. She says, hang on. And there were other places, there was also, maybe you knew Bill Johnson from Stanford, who uh, he wanted to have a synthesis of complicated molecules, uh, steroids, for instance, in one way, in one, uh, from squalene, in one shot. It took him 20 years. And many people told him, stop it. But at the end, he got it. So, yeah, it's difficult. You cannot look 20 years ahead. That is, unfortunately, we don't know what happens. New methods appear, new ways of looking at things, and new ideas, so very difficult. So that's not a, an answer to the question, but it is very difficult to decide. Maria? I agree with both uh, these things, both of my, my colleagues. But I'd like to add another option. Usually, when we're carrying out a research project, or when we're designing it, we know exactly what we want to do. But then you start researching, and on the way, other things tend to crop up, or other avenues open up. And it's not a case of abandoning what you're doing. It's just that new possibilities are constantly opening up. And I think that's what happens to all scientists. You, you, you know, you start down, walking down one path, uh, but you know, the, that path branches off. And sometimes the, the path that's branched off is more important than the initial path that you started to walk down. <laughs> Whichever you like. I think we're having a scientific one now. Question number 70 from uh, Thumaya School in Thumaya. It's a question for all three of our guests. And the question is, one of the biggest problems today is cancer. Now, do you think that we will be able to produce nanorobots or viruses capable of identifying and killing tumor cells in the relatively near future? That's going on already. There are same several papers now with the new messenger RNA, and I was in Mainz at the BioNTech about three weeks ago. There are now already two vaccines against specific uh, cancers that will develop, so I think um, it's, that will be possible to develop vaccines, and there will be other progress being made for uh, cancers, and uh, it can be from all types of uh, size, uh, all types of directions also. Uh, we have now a drug in, uh, just to say also that we are also interested in applications, despite what I said at the beginning. 
I still believe that I, I'm interested in basic research, but when something applied happens to be interesting, of course, we don't leave it for others. <laughs> we have a drug in a clinic in Zurich, uh, which is an anti-cancer drug, so okay, and which is a totally different approach, uh, relying on oxygen supply, because we are all oxygenated organisms, so hypoxia is a uh, low oxygen levels is a sign of a characteristic of tumors, and if you compensate that, if you have the, the possibility to transform hypoxia into normoxia, lots of, a lot of interesting things happen. In fact, now even gene expression depends on it. And there have been uh, the, uh, the methylations of histones. You mentioned uh, viruses that could attack cancer cells. This is a very active field of research, and there are some recent clinical trials involving yeah. oncolytic viruses that uh, look extremely effective, or at least very promising. So I, I think that's an area of research that's going to be very fruitful. Yeah. And you say nanorobots. I mean, people are thinking about so the problem is that cancer cells are very similar to normal cells, especially stem cells. And so you can't usually just have one feature that will specifically identify and kill a cancer cell. So you need essentially logic gates that will take two or three or four different properties and say if all of these things are fulfilled, then kill the cell. So this is a little bit abstract, but this is a direction that this field is going in. One of the messenger RNA vaccines is already in clinic. There's a paper where they use it in clinic. Yes. But a very limited, it's a, it's a pancreatic cancer, but uh, well, there's some, a some really mutations. Uh, fascinating new direction. So in tumor cells, um, because they're, they're growing very rapidly and they often uh, become highly mutagenic, you start to make uh, mutated proteins. So these are so-called neoepitopes that can be recognized. Uh, and because of the advances in DNA sequencing, uh, you can identify a lot of these from one tumor and then develop a vaccine that will um, target many of these variations and can be, this is looking, it's early stage, but it's looking very promising. Bibliographical? Now a bibliographic question maybe. Number 18 from Toki Alai School in Irun. Number 18. It's a question for Jean-Marie Lynn. How did your passion for studying chemistry come about? Did you have a role model? We have all role models, I think. But uh, it came from what I said earlier so somewhat. Chemistry has uh, the power of making things which don't exist yet by recombining atoms. Of course, we have a limited number of atoms, like a toolbox, like a Lego set, and then you can recombine, but you can make things which don't exist yet. So I am more interested in trying to see the space of chemistry, which is not yet made, than the space of chemistry, which is already here. We are part of it. So that is uh, the fact that you have a sort of, uh, you, have a, you have a power over matter. This is something which is sort of Promethean. No? You act on the intrinsic. It's not just a surface. It's not just like a statue. It's not like a painting, where of course there are different creations. But chemistry, you do what is inside matter. You rearrange the intimacy of matter. And that is what excited me. Maria, you want to answer this question? Maria, can you respond to that? About role models. Well, I didn't. 
I didn't really have many role models, to be perfectly honest. But you just, you know, you just, little by little, you just, you know, pick at the wall and you, you, you get there little by little by working very hard. A general question now. Number 95 from Colo Michelena School in Vittoria Gasteiz. It's a question for Jack Sostak. address ethical issues in your work, especially in projects related to the creation of artificial life. Thank you. Yeah, so I think uh, people, when they see phrases like artificial life, synthetic biology, start to worry about, you know, the development of some new uh, pathogen that might lead to some epidemic. Um, I think that's not, fortunately, really relevant to what we're doing. We're trying to understand the very beginnings of life, and uh, early life is so primitive, just you know, barely able to replicate. So even if we're successful, uh, what we create would not be able, first of all, not be able to compete, let alone parasitize anything that exists now. Uh, what we're the molecules that we use to try to create synthetic cells are not part of modern biology. And so there's, essentially what we're trying to do, I think, is extremely safe. There is no danger. But if you, these questions do arise in related fields, right, where the advances in synthetic biology mean that anybody with the DNA synthesizer can create extremely dangerous uh, molecules that can engineer uh, viruses. Um, there's all kinds of technologies that are potentially both incredibly beneficial, but also we have to think of the, the potential dangers. So I, I think that's a question that's very, very relevant to the development of new biological technologies, but maybe not related to what we're specifically doing. Maybe there is something I would like to add Please. to that. The beginning of the question was, uh, what about ethical considerations in scientific work? In more general terms, more general. that was the beginning. Personally, I think that we have only re we have really responsibility to truth and ethics. Ethics run behind. In all developments of you in, in human, some people think it's written in stone. It's not written in stone. We will change our points of view as we get more knowledge, and I think we will transform ourselves, we will have a different ethical considerations. I don't think the laws of ethics are written in stone. That is very much contrary to what you call a religion. I think where, where things get difficult is we're trying to do something that's beneficial for humanity, but at the same time, the, there are always applications that yeah. are not so good. And, and sure, but I don't uh, think we are trying to do things beneficial. We should not do that. We should just que have a quest for knowledge. And then we have to decide whether what we discover is good or no good for some purpose. But knowledge is knowledge. The <coughs> atomic energy leads to the bomb, but also to reactors. And uh, my answer also is often, evolution has given us hands, okay? I have hands. I can caress or strangle. So, evolution was very bad because it gave us hands. <laughs> but I can use them in a different way. Yeah. 
but then what you're really saying is we have to think about the applications and be careful. To some extent. <laughs> I'm not so sure, personally. <laughs> well, so things are not clear. Another question. Let's go. So the one that we just chose was the 46. Inteligencia artificial are in applications. Since artificial intelligence will be applied to the human body and its behavior, do you think that a human's personal memories and personality could be transferred to a robotic body before that person died? And what would be the risks if we were able to do that? That's a question for Jack Sostak. Uh, I mean, this is uh, currently in the realm of science fiction, right? I mean, we see this in uh, movies and uh, TV shows. Um, I, I think the, yeah, I, I, I don't know if that would ever be possible. It seems, seems incredibly uh, unlikely given what we know now, but uh, who knows in, in, in the future. Um, but along the way to a goal like that, we have to understand how the brain works. How does the brain give rise to the mind? Uh, I think this is a much more interesting question than can we ever, you know, transfer our minds into a computer system. Just understanding how the mind works is, is a big enough question for, for me. <laughs> That's for sure. Biographical question now. Number seven. It's from Arzaro Ica School in Oyerzun. And it's a question for Jean-Marie Lynn. Which aspect of your work in basic research has surprised you most? And how do you think these studies may influence future scientific advances? Probably what I'm mostly interested in is how come that self-organization exists and uh, this is a general feature of, uh, again, of our universe. It's a general property, maybe even a cosmic imperative. Uh, so um, this aspect of having been driven by certain uh, the as I said, the basic laws of physics are the ones which rule everything. But the fact that this can then be translated into, uh, into artificial systems, say, like in a laboratory, making molecules which will assem assemble, like a virus assembles. Viruses are made from pieces. A virus is not living, as you know. And so uh, this possibility to uh, have systems to set up systems which can self-organize is something which I find very interesting and I think is a basic property which also will exist in the future because it's really the development, the structuration of our visible matter which uh, is uh, ruled by the self-organization processes. Of course, I agree with Jack that uh, the mind is really the ultimate frontier for the moment. We might have, that, might have another one later on. Thinking beyond your own thinking, but that's another question. <laughs> okay. okay, a scientific question now. Number 69 from Urechu Zumarraga School in Urechu. And it's a question for Maria Bayet. The question is, what do you think the most revolutionary applications of intelligent biomaterials will be in the near future? And how will they affect our society? Well, there can be no doubt 
the fact that it's the fact that they can actually move around the bloodstream and reach uh, different tissues, the tissues of the organ that, where they're most needed. And then they can apply a stimulus there and release the drugs that will solve the problem. I think that's, without a doubt, that's uh, going to be the most revolutionary application. If we could achieve that, that would be absolutely magnificent. And I hope that we're going to achieve it in the very near future. How long do you think? Oh, sorry, how long have we got left? Well, I think we're just going to have to have a, a, maybe the last question. Maybe one question, and then I'll just say some closing words and we'll go and have a photograph. So, last question, a general question. Okay. Question number 89. And again, it's from uh, Chingudi, uh, Chingudi School in Irun. It's a question for Maria Bayet. Why do you think fewer women are engaged in science? And what can we do to improve this situation? I think it's changing. In my generation, it's true that there are very few women. And the ones that were there, they often dropped out of university. Very few actually uh, graduated. There was a very small critical mass of women. But now, if you look at the university sphere, I mean, not looking at STEM subjects, because I think that's a whole different kettle of fish. We can talk about it during coffee, if you like. But in general, in the other disciplines and areas of science, in many degrees, there are more women than men. In chemistry, uh, at my university in Madrid, 60% are women. And in my time, it was only 20%. And in, in pharmacy, I think women, are, there are 80% of students are female. So there are more uh, female students studying. So if there's more critical mass of women, then there's going to be more eminent female scientists. I mean, before we didn't have the critical mass, so I think things are changing. It's also true, and this is something that I feel quite sad about, that a scientific career, at least in Spain, isn't easy. It's not an easy career. Uh, you can't, you know, you don't get success at an early age. You, I think we were talking about, you know, in order to get recognition, you need to be maybe 40, 42, I think that's the mean age. It's, it's quite a long time to wait, and it, it's very difficult. And often, with the younger girls, and they're amazing, young women who've done fantastic theses, they're really smart, and then all of a sudden they decide to become secondary school teachers and, and they leave their scientific career, I mean, pure science. Uh, I think the key to that has to do with personal issues. Uh, a scientific career is difficult, but it's really worthwhile. I have three kids and I'm, you know, I've got where I am today. So we don't have to, I don't think you have to sacrifice anything, but you have to really like what you're doing and you have to just be work hard. You've got to be like a worker ant. Right, well, after this very animated session, I think it's been the most animated session that uh, we've uh, ever had of the Topak Attack, at least in recent years, I would just like to say one thing. Something that's come up time and time again. Uh, scientific freedom should be absolute. We shouldn't impose anything on science. Scientists should be free to research what interests them. Basic research is very important. I think that what is clear, um, and Cohen Tanucci said this once, is, is water, energy, health, uh, the increase of intolerance, fundamentalism, all of these uh, major problems uh, are not going to be solved through less science. They're going to be solved through more education. But somebody has to formulate the questions. Somebody has to decide what the key questions are going to be for science. Maybe we should take a vote. I mean, should we all vote on what Maria has to research? Maybe all the taxpayers in Madrid should be voting on uh, what she has to research. But I think there's a consensus here. Uh, over and above the different nuances that might exist in our different opinions. But I think that 
scientists should be free to formulate their own questions. They should have utter freedom to research what they want. But it's also true that the history of science have shown, has shown that in general, questions that seem to be useless at the time have turned out to be the most useful ones. I give a talk often, uh, which is entitled The Sublime, Sublime Usefulness of Science. Because uh, the positron, for example, I mean, who, who thought that would be any use at all or have any kind of uh, application at all? But I don't think uh, that the, the, the Higgs waves, uh, no one thought about their applications. And, and this actually, this issue uh, came up in the opening ceremony. I was talking about uh, Senator Pastore in the United States, the United States Senate, and he asked Mr. Wilson, who was the director of the Fermilab, when they were making accelerators, and said, what's the point of those accelerators? Uh, are, they, are they useful to, for defending our country? And uh, the man said, no, they don't, nothing to do well, with security. And uh, the director of the lab said, no, they're not useless just because they don't, uh, they're not important for security. They're there for mutual respect for the basic values of human life. They have to do with having good novelists, good painters, good sculptures. Uh, they, they, they're useful for all the things that we love in our country uh, and what, the reasons that make us uh, patriots. But they're not there to defend our country, they, but they are there to make our country worth defending. So this was sort of an ode to knowledge and thinking. And this is what we should be defending as well. This is what we should be advocating. If we just defend science because of its potential usefulness, then I don't think we should be... Uh, or if we just defend science uh, for money, then uh, we just have to be expected to be judged on that same basis. So we shouldn't do that. We need to advocate science for science's sake. And I think this is one of the basic reasons why we uh, established this science festival, Passion for Knowledge. Not everything has to be useful. Uh, something, a philosophy, for example, uh, makes us good. The, the, the person who actually won the Princess of Asturias Prize this year, has just died, in fact, before he was able to receive the prize, and uh, he has a very interesting book called um, The Usefulness of That Which Isn't Useful. Obviously, science has its limits. Uh, uh, we have uh, different uh, limits, but there are scientific limits, but there are, should there be ethical limits to science? Well, that's a whole other debate, and I'd love to chair that debate with the speakers who are here with us today, but we don't have time for that today, unfortunately. We'll have to organize it on another occasion. What is clear is that science is a collective effort. It involves many different people. Uh, we're standing on the shoulders of those who have gone before us. But there are some unique people in that history. There are people who have made a massive quantum leap forward. And three of those people are here with us today. And we acknowledge them, we admire them, but you can see they argue, they interrupt each other sometimes. You know, they correct each other. They're normal people at the end of the world. They're normal just like you. And again, with hard work, with effort, with imagination and their brilliant minds, they've achieved what they've achieved, but they're, they're, they're normal people. If you work hard with your excellent teachers, and I know some of your teachers and I know they're excellent, but if you work hard, you can be like them. So get going, and thank you all very much for coming. And now it's time for a group photo. It's a shame. Uh, that we don't have it, you know, like if you go to a fun fair, uh, you could actually get the photo printed and you can all sign it. We won't be able to do that today, unfortunately, but maybe next time. Thank you all to you. Thank you to your teachers. And I hope you've enjoyed the session.